Okay, um, I want to share with you first the picture I took this June. I mean, this actually is not June, this March when I was in China, and uh, I was visiting the nursery. Uh, all those are grafted watermelons. And uh, that was me. And you see the scale there. Uh, this this part probably about a million or more uh, grafted uh, watermelons just from one nursery. So uh, this is in China, and you can tell that uh, you know they are really working on it. It's in, you know most people here are small farmers, and I don't think you can uh, you can use so many uh, watermelon transplants in your farm. And they do make a lot of money too. Okay, um, I usually go with some pictures first before I get to the real, real stuff. Well, this is real as well. Uh, back in 2010, I was able to uh, visit uh, Lisbon, Portugal, uh, when I was with the International so uh, Horticulture Society Congress, and uh, we went on a tour. Now, that's in the in one of the greenhouse is hydroponic uh, culture of tomatoes, and if you look at carefully here, they are grafted. And I asked the manager why he wanted to do this. They said, uh, you know, there are several reasons. Number one reason is the yield. And, uh, you know, they can produce much, much more. And the second reason was, you can see this is a single plant, tomato plant. You can one, two, three. This has uh, actually three liters. Usually for the greenhouse production of tomatoes, we only do one liter. But if you do grafting, and if you choose the right rootstock, you can actually keep up to seven, that's according to the manager. Even though I don't recommend this, but this can keep two liters. And this one was taken back in 2010, again in, in, in Gainesville, Florida, in the greenhouse setting. You know, in, in Florida, there were, there were large farmers. This is big greenhouse operation. Uh, I don't know if you can see the picture really well, and, but on the left, those are grafted ones. On the right, those are non-grafted ones. You can see here it's pretty clean, but on the right side, there are a lot of plants dying, and they were caused by the Fusarium wilt disease. So that's one big disease for uh, uh, tomatoes, it's the soil-borne diseases. And uh, here, a picture showing some of the vines uh, tomato vines are dying or yellowing or declining in growth. And uh, if we dig this out, you see a little, you know, this is normal pretty much. This is not normal. There are root nematodes in there. Okay, uh, how many of you here are from um, Missouri? Okay. You know, in this region, we used to see we, are, we were zone five. Or, you know, if you go further, zone 5B, you mean 4, 4, 4B. So we don't worry about the root nematodes because we tended to think nematodes cannot survive in the winter. But if you go south of Missouri, uh, root nematodes can survive in winter. However, you know, you've been watching the news, the su you know, the Superstorm Stanley attacked the East Coast really badly. And a lot of people blame that uh, uh, was because of the climate change. So, uh, well, this is just, I will come back to, to, later, uh, to this later. So, uh, you know, whether you believe it or not, the, the, you know, it's getting warmer. The USDA released the new cold hardness zoom map. So if you look at this, you know, here is Columbia area, running here. And we used to be 5B or 5A, now it becomes 6, A and B, which means we are much warmer. And uh, if you come back to the root nematodes, in this kind of weather, they can survive. So we do have a trouble with, the, with, with root nematodes in the future, or we already have that. And uh, if you are not a real farmer and you do uh, gardens in your yard, or you have a have small farm, you do gardening your, on your small farm, and uh, you have to pay attention to this because uh, a couple years ago we did a survey, and almost every single community gardens in the Columbia area, in the Kansas City area, were affected by nematodes. So by doing grafting, this is research done by Dr. Jaw from the University of Florida, 
you can see this is ungrafted, and this is a uh, grafted on Multiford. Multiford is one uh, uh, rootstock variety, and this is self-grafted. And don't ask me why we do this, because you know, for publication, we have to graft on yourself. Otherwise, he said, why you didn't have this control? So anyway, if you can see this number, ungrafted is 4.6, self-grafted is 4.4, and the non uh, grafted one is 0 to 0 0.8. And the higher number, the, seve the, the severe, the, the root, uh, the nematode infection. So grafting is one way to fight with root nematodes. And uh, you know, this morning the keynote speaker talked about sustainability. So no matter what we think the definition of sustainability is, if you cannot produce, you cannot make money, and uh, you cannot sustain. So grafting can add uh, one useful tool to your small farm op operation so you can have a better uh, crop, especially with, especially with tomatoes. And this picture is from uh, Dr. Wayne Fish, and uh, this field of watermelons were infected by, by, by Fusarium wheel disease, and it can be disastrous. And usually, if we see fields like this, we'll just tell farmers to plow everything. You cannot make any money anymore. So um, this picture was taken this year in China. They grafted all those uh, watermelons. That was back in March. They used this tunnel, low, uh, low tunnel and a low tunnel, and then the plastic mulch to do those watermelon production. Their, gain, their objective is to target May 1st market, which is International Labor Day. Uh, by doing this protection that help with the uh, watermelon plants. However, one trick for them to be able to produce and to sell by May 1st, this is back in, uh, in March, is grafting of watermelons. So uh, back to this one, Dr. Fish did some research, and I'll show you a picture later. By doing grafting, you would be able to have a clean field and uh, disease-free. And I've been mentioning this, this disease problem for a couple, a couple of times now. And we used to have uh, the mesobromide, right? That, uh, that's got a ban because of the greenhouse gas release. So we used to be able to fumigate the soil, but now we're not able to. And uh, the new product to mesobromide is coming out in the market, but we don't know exactly how they will be, do will be doing to our soil and to our environment. So grafting is one alternative for um, fumigation. Uh, again, this is back, 10, this, uh, back in 2010. I was there uh, visiting their high tunnels. Those vertically grown uh, watermelons were grafted. And by doing so, they claim to have increased vigor, enhanced cold tolerance. You know, watermelon is a warm season vegetable. They love heat, they don't love cold. And then they improved yield and quality significantly. I'll show some pictures later. And the more important, increased disease resistance. And I was there, and uh, you know, it's funny the, how they do those smaller icebox type of watermelon. And uh, we just cut it open, it's really the best watermelon ever tasted. It's not a chilled, just right from the field in the high tunnel. Wonderful. And uh, uh, Dr. Zhao from Florida, and she's been doing some research on melon grafting. And if you look carefully, those are grafted. And the cucumber is not a, you know, cucumber is not as important here, uh, even though we love pickles. However, those greenhouse or Chinese type, green, uh, Chinese type uh, cucumbers are not uh, popular in this country. However, the English greenhouse type cucumber, those that are uh, burp free, you know, there's no bumps on that. You can see that at the grocery store and it's very expensive. Those have a market and uh, it's a good way to graft them. However, back to this picture, I'm telling you this is June. 
2010, the plants were actually planted in August or, or late August or early September the year before. They didn't look this tall. However, just think, I'll show a picture later, but think about they've been grown from September to June and still produce them. And one trick to that is they grafted them. And you see this one, maybe not clear to you. And there one farmer there, you can see the production part for the water, for the vine is about this tall. They produce them. And down there, the vine just piled here. It could be three, four, five meters long, and I'm about one point a half. So it's very long. And uh, you, to keep the vigor, to keep them producing, you have to do something. So grafting is one way to do that. And here um, is uh, one grafted uh, water, uh, melon, I mean not melon, cucumber. This actually is from a squash, the rootstock. Those are cucumber leaves. And I can show you by choosing the variety, this is the same variety grafted on two different uh, rootstocks. And this one, you cannot really see well, has a really good quality. And this one is normal. So by doing grafting, by choosing carefully a right rootstock, you can enhance the, 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 the quality. And they do eggplants. You know, we have two large cities in Missouri, Kansas City and St. Louis. There are large population from Asia and from Africa, even European peoples, they love eggplants. And those plants actually are grafted. If they don't graft them, you could not expect a large crop for eggplants because they just cannot grow really well in winter time. This picture was taken in in February. Think about the use of solar greenhouse, no heating, produce eggplants in winter time. It's amazing. And that's some of the topics been working on, trying to introduce the solar greenhouse to this part of the, the nation. But uh, I've been facing some difficulty with the city code, with the university regulation, all those that hadn't happened yet. Okay, so those are the picture tour, a little tour for, to give you uh, some thinking about uh, grafting. And here I want to touch base is that the grafting actually is really old technology. I'm not going to go, go to a lot about history. You know, my wife always say, you talk about this, the past, that, you're getting old. I say, I am getting old, but the history is good as well. So anyway, it's, you know, the, this starts in China in fifth century. The commercial grafting started in 1936 in Japan. You know, Japan is it's a, it's basically a big island. They have a very limited land space, not like here. So they, they, they grow watermelons year after year in the same plot. No matter what they do, eventually the disease problem got them. So one farmer just was so, mar so smart, he grafted watermelon onto squash, and he was successful. Of course, you know, we always think farmers are smarter than scientists like me. I agree with that. Um, you know, they, they, they try different things, and later the, the technology was spread out in Europe because European countries also have a, well, we will not have the advantages we do here. You know, think, think about it here, 150 acres is a small farm, right? Very small, but if you have 150 acres in China and in Europe, you will be rich. So, so in Europe, they, they've been doing that. And uh, now in this country, I think tomato grafting is on its way. And uh, North Carolina in the state is, was the first the university started to do this. Dr. Mary Pete, is, she started this. And uh, uh, now there are several universities working on the big specialty crop research initiative grant. They are, they are targeting uh, soil burn diseases, the targeting insect pests, and also targeting virus. So we don't know what the research is going to come out yet. But I want to tell you one thing is we are behind the Asian country and the European country on vegetable grafting. And the reason behind that is you know, the, the South Korea, Japan, China, they published a lot of good stuff, but no, not in English. So, and we tend to think we're number one, so we ignore them for so many years. Okay, this, the, some data showing that in South Korea, 
uh, for watermelon, cucumber, and orange melon, nearly over 95% are grafted. And uh, some others, you know, this is not reported, but still, if you think about greenhouse production for those uh, crops, uh, you'll find out the uh, majority of them actually, uh, not, it's, this is back 2007, basically 20, well, 2005 data, but now, you know, the most uh, greenhouse type warm season vegetables are grafted. And if you look at this though, you'll see that you only see, you know, tomatoes, melons, and other stuff. Here, that's the cucurbits. Uh, you don't see tomatoes there. Those are all warm season, high value vegetable species. You don't want to graft uh, uh, broccoli or something because you will not make money and it's not sustainable. Okay, in North America, uh, about 40 millions uh, in the uh, British Columbia area. And Mexico has a lot grafted water, uh, tomatoes and also watermelons as well because of the disease problem here, the fusarium real disease. And uh, in this country, especially, I mean, I have seen a lot of farmers try this. And uh, one thing surprised me, I actually have seen a lot of must gardeners, home gardeners, they try doing grafting. And I show you how you can do that at home at the very end if I still have time. Uh, this is the advantage. Basically, the uh, uh, by doing grafting, you have uh, the advantage of using the resistance to the to sorghum disease of rootstock, and then usually the grafted plants will have a um, it will be more vigorous, and uh, we, you have enhanced yield and quality to most cases, and. Uh, the other thing is cold hardiness. You know, the, the high, high tunnel equip program from NRCS has become a such st strong program in Northwest. So people are using high tunnels for season extension and cold hardiness is getting more important. So grafting actually can enhance that part. And some rootstock actually can uh, transfer the heat tolerance. And you know, we have been heard enough about the heat and dry. When I was doing my slides last uh, yesterday, I was using some of the old presentations I give, and in there I said, extreme hot and dry year in 2011. I removed that part because this year <laughs> actually made a new record. So, so this is one example from Dr. Sally Miller from Ohio State. Um, she did some research and trust to match, you know, this, this, this is just different uh, tomato varieties. And uh, Maxi Fort is a rootstock. You, you can see that the, this resistance here, the TMV, the tobacco, tobacco mosaic virus, C5 is uh, leaf mold, V is uh, venticillium, uh, F2 is uh, fulzerum wilt, research one and two, and FR is uh, fulzerum crown and the root rot, Main aim is the root nematodes, and the key is the corky root rod. So by tuning this one, you actually can transfer all those resistance to your to your scion. And if you don't know what a scion is, you'll know it in a few minutes. And uh, just think about that. You know, if you have heirloom tomatoes, you know this is the way to do. Okay, and uh, you know, like everything else, is disadvantage there. And uh, I always tell people. You know, I'm kind of smart, but I'm short. <laughs> I'm stating the fact. Well, not the smart part. <laughs> anyway, the cost, you know, will be added the cost because you have to use root stocks. And then you have to physically graft them. So there might be some grafting compatibility issue, which I did research on with tomatoes. If you don't have time to go to my talk in the afternoon, I can tell you, I tried 21 heirloom varieties with three rootstocks. Is they all they were they all took very well, so it's, it should be okay. And then sometimes you know the fruit quality may be down. This is more f more true for uh, cucurbits like cucumber, melon, and watermelon. But tomatoes seem not to be affected. Okay. Um, for the added cost, Dr. Levert um, from, uh, from Kansas, um, he used to be a PhD student in North Carolina State uh, working with Dr. Mary Pete, who 
started uh, the first vegetable grafting almost in the uh, land grant university. So for tomato uh, plants, grafted and non-grafted transplants, uh, the production cost about uh, 59 cents versus 13 cents in North Carolina, and the one dollar twenty-five for grafted and the, and the 51 in Pennsylvania. I don't know why Pennsylvania was doing that. So there were added costs to citizens. But if you break down the cost, um, I apologize if you cannot see really well. Uh, the majority cost goes to seed, which is your rootstock seed. And then you add 24% of the labor. So for the added seed and labor, that's about the four, uh, 57%. So if you can bring down the seed cost and uh, improve your skill in grafting, or you don't even mind because you just do it for fun, if you have a high tunnel, you know, the maximum is 300 plants, you can do it easily. So you reduce the cost, uh, the cost significantly. But others, the heating and transplant labor, you know, that's just typical to uh, regular transplant production as well. So for watermelon, Dr. Fish did some research, non-grafted ones, about uh, 28 cents per piece, grafted ones, about 75 cents. So you put into an acre, about 1,500 plants, that's about $700 more per acre. However, if you have maybe 50% of your watermelons, or I mean actually 25%, affected by fusarium wilt disease, and then you have a 12%, 3.6% return. And you know, for new field, we don't expect the soil borne disease to be a trouble, but you do, if you do have a, uh, you, if, you, if you do have a planted uh, watermelon year after year, and you don't have enough land to uh, root it, you do have trouble. And the, you know, if you have fusarium wilt disease in your soil, you cannot uh, really do watermelon really well. So um, his research showing that, uh, or his recommendation was, yeah, by doing grafting, you can expect some return if you have disease problems in your field. So that was his uh, recommendation. So um, now it comes to what is grafting um, part. And I usually use a tomato, but this time I use a cucurbit. And uh, if you look carefully, you can see one, two, three, four, there are four pieces of cotton lindens. And uh, you know cucurbit is dicot. That means a two piece. But why is it four? But you look more carefully, those, those here, these two big pieces of cotton lindens, and uh, this one, and this rose, that's from rootstock. And then this one uh, is the uh, cucumber or watermelon, you cannot tell the difference. This is called a scion. So basically your scion only provides the top part of a plant or van or vine. And, and the lower part, uh, and the, especially the roots, are from your rootstock. So now you know what is the scion, what is the rootstock. And by doing those things, join those two pieces together, we call it the grafting. And later, this is called, uh, you know, become the graft union. I guess if you have a grafted uh, tree fruit before, you are familiar with this. The technology actually is very similar. But uh, people are just worried about how to do it because it's so tender. I can squeeze it really easily. However, because they are herbaceous, they are very easy to recover. So I'll show you a picture in the future, uh, in, the, in the next few minutes. So later, this plant will grow like this. So this is your watermelon, and this is still your, uh, your rootstock. Could be a squash, could be a, a bottle gourd. This is how, how I did. I found out uh, doing, uh, I did this quite a bit in China, when I was in China. But uh, I, I always have, a tr have a good luck with tomatoes, but not really good luck with uh, cucurbits. Because cucurbits have trouble to recover once they're getting older. Okay. Uh, so I threw something here. I just want to know that uh, grafting of vegetables is really easy. You know, you just don't be scared. It's very easy to do. For, for some of you who have done this, you, you, can, you can concur with what I said. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, and it's very easy to be successful. To, for tomato grafting, if you have never done that before and, uh, and follow 
what I told you, or you know, I did some workshops before, you can easily get a 70% 70, 70 survival. And for me, I can get at least 95. So it's, it's very easy to do. So, uh, but you do have to have some extra stuff, like, in, uh, uh, well, uh, extra cost. And there are different um, uh, methods to do those, and I'll tell you uh, in a few minutes. And also, uh, if you have a high tunnel and all greenhouse, and uh, you want to grow tomatoes or, or, or melons or cucumbers, grafting can help you reach your goal. Um, especially for, for farmers who produce for farmer's market, you want to use heirloom tomatoes, I think, I think uh, you, you may want to think about a grafting. And, and this one here is commercial rootstock only available for tomatoes, which is not uh, true anymore. There are some uh, seed companies that carry uh, uh, watermelon or, or cucumber uh, rootstocks. Usually you can share uh, rootstock species between cucumber, melon, or uh, watermelon. So uh, there, are, there are seeds companies that carry commercial rootstocks for cucurbits, not only for tomatoes anymore. And the rootstock for tomatoes can also be used for grafting uh, eggplant and, uh, and the pepper uh, because they are in the same family. Okay, this is a flow chart. Actually, this is from Dr. Zhao. Uh, well, I modified it. First step, you, before you do grafting, you have to do some work to choose the right scion on rootstocks, and then you plant seeds. You schedule the best time to graft uh, you, because you do apply some physical damage to the plants, and then you do the grafting. You monitor the healing process. Uh, acclimata uh, acclimatation is very important. I'll show you the picture. And then, once they healed really well, you can plant them or manage them as regular transplants. Uh, so I'm going to go to a specific uh, a variety, I mean, uh, methods now. The, the, the this table shows you the rootstock varieties. Um, here I listed the Beaufort, Maxifort. This unreleased, I think, is the Mortifort. Um, you know, from different companies. And uh, um, I tried the Beaufort before, Beaufort and Maxifort. If you, uh, if you look at this, this R means resistant, and S means sus uh, sus sus susceptible. So for TMV, Corky Roads, uh, Fusarium wilt, uh, Vedicinium wilt, wilt disease, and root nematodes, Southern blight, this is a very severe disease for a uh, uh, southern part of uh, um, Missouri because those can stay in soil for seven years or more. So you can see that uh, Beaufort and Maxifort are doing pretty well. And uh, for this one, the RST04105, uh, which I tried this year, they had all those resistance. So if you buy a commercial available rootstock variety, there will be numbers, I mean, there will be letters in there telling you resistance. So choose more resistant treats and uh, use that as your rootstock. Uh, Maxi Ford is very powerful, very uh, vigorous uh, tomato, and it's just like a cherry tomato. Uh, most of those are like a cherry tomatoes. Uh, if you want to do maxi fort, you actually can keep two, three liters in the greenhouse or high tunnels. Uh, Beaufort is uh, uh, vig medium vigor, and this one I haven't really uh, done a lot with yet. But this just give you some example that um, the seed companies uh, do have some information available for you when you choose the rootstocks. And this picture was taken back in 20, uh, 2009, this is, uh, uh, you know, you see all those uh, plants um, pretty much were dying because of frost. But your Max Frost is growing really well, very strong. And uh, my Beaufort is okay as well. So they are very vigorous uh, varieties. And they do produce cherry type yellow fuzzy uh, fruit. And I tasted them, they were not so tasty. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm still alive. <laughs> so uh, people always ask me, can I use those again? 
Uh, my answer is probably not, but if you are not a commercial farmers, you can save seeds Then people saying, I didn't do research, it just people said the second generation still works really well, especially for home gardeners. Um, those are frost damage here. Those are just old. Yeah, so the, it itself d does show the vigor and the some frost tolerance. Uh, his question is, is this a frost damage or, or something? Yeah. Uh, this, is the, this is in your handout. I, this was from uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Revert and uh, uh, about a tubing grafting. Uh, I, I forgot to bring the tubes with me. Uh, however, um, if you go go do a tube Tube gra uh, a grafting tube, you, you will find the information, how they look like. But actually, I have that, and this is the tube here. So for tubing grafting, uh, those tubes were designed specifically for this. Basically, you, you, you grow your plant, you cut it. This is your rootstock. Uh, I'll have a more picture later. You can cut it above the cotton landings or below it. I recommend it to cut it below it if you have enough, uh, if, if a taller plant. And then you put, uh, otherwise you have a suckers grow out from these two pieces of cotyledons. You put a tube on it, and then you cut your, uh, your scion. You, you just slide it in, and then make sure the surface contact is pretty easy to do. I have a more picture to show you. And uh, the most important thing is not about how you do it, is after you're doing it, how you keep them alive, because there is physical disconnected this, it is, there's no connection, and the plant still needs water, so this plant will wilt. So during that uh, heating period, you have to keep high moisture. I found out uh, the moisture is important for tomatoes. The cold temperature is even more important. Last year, I did some demonstration for uh, some uh, uh, school kids, and uh, then I had to go somewhere to, for a meeting away from my office for a week. So what I did is just throw into my through those uh, in my office without a covering anything. My office was cold in summertime, about um, 70 uh, inside of my office. So when I came back seven days later, they all survived. So that made me thinking maybe the temperature is as important, if not if not more important than the humidity when it comes to heating the uh, tomato uh, new grafts. So, so if you do that in the greenhouse and have a sun, sunlight, and uh, your, your tunnel or your uh, chilling, uh, heating chamber can be easily uh, heat up, and that will reduce the survival rate of your grafted tomatoes. So basically, for D103, we recommend, we recommend close to 100% darkness and an above 90% relative humidity. Your temperature shouldn't be beyond 25 degrees Celsius, which is about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. If you go above 80, because the, the higher rate of transpiration, your plants may lose water so, f so quickly and your plants will die. And then, from day four to seven, slowly reduce darkness and then, and then keep, about, keep this about 75% relative humidity. And then after a after week, as long as you avoid direct sunlight, you'll be okay because the usually it takes seven to 10 days. I would think seven days is good enough for them to grow together. And uh, there are research showing the anatomy over there. Yeah, it's about seven to 10 days, they can grow together. Um, Here's uh, some of the last things you need to do. Uh, is you have rootstock, scion, razor blades, you know, whatever is sharp for you is fine. And uh, you can use clips like this or tubes. And for the tubes, there are two types. It's 1.5 millimeter uh, and 2.0 millimeter. We're talking about the diameter of the hole, especially here. So if you want to buy, buy 2.0 because uh, those will handle a little bit larger uh, tomato seedlings. And you can, for the growth chamber, or uh, we can also call it an incubator, 
You can just build some frame and cover with some black plastic, and then another layer of transparent, uh, transparent plastic to keep the humidity and, uh, and the, the light off. You know, it's pretty easy to do. And if you want to add, a, uh, you can spray on the side uh, of your chamber with a sprayer, or you can put uh, uh, an, an humidifier. You know, it's pretty easy to do. Unless you are serious nursery man, and you know, this is good enough for you because you don't want to graft a lot of uh, plants at the same time. And uh, the next, show some pictures. That's what I use. You know, my technician built this frame and is covered with plastic. And uh, we have a, a black above the, 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 the white ones or transparent ones because later we just remove those ones. And some people build kind of a, a arch type frame. So they cover it with this. And in China, they just do this, uh, you know, bowls and put some cover, uh, put some cover on it, plastic cover inside the high tunnel. You know, you can see all those grafted transplants there. It's pretty easy to do. Actually, this is not the grafted ones. Uh, but you can, you can do whatever you need to do. And uh, for, farm, for home gardeners, I can actually see people just cover with, with some whatever container you have. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, this is a different method for, cleft, for tomato. It's the second method. It's called a cleft grafting. Uh, to do this, you need a clips. And you can also buy them. Uh, cleft, graft, cleft grafting is more suitable for uh, 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 for eggplants and uh, and the pepper because they, they grow slow and uh, uh, they cannot recover really well by tubing because tub tubes were designed for tomatoes. Uh, however, you can also use for uh, use them use this method for tomato grafting. Actually, this one works really well if you didn't have a time to to graft them when they were small. You can wait until they grow a little bit larger to do the cleft grafting. So you do if you miss the first window, you can still do it. Okay, uh, to do cleft grafting, your your rootstock need to grow at least the three to five true leaves, and then you cut your rootstock. You make a, a vertical cut on the stem. It's also this is also in your handout, and then you cut your uh, your scion in the V shape. So you just put this in. You can see this here. And you put a, a clip on it, and move them to the to the chamber, and uh, afterwards they will grow. It's very easy to do. It is similar to uh, cleft grafting method for for your uh, grapes or other other tree fruit. It's very easy to do. And uh, uh, I, from here, I'm going to show you pictures how we do uh, in the gra in in my greenhouse to do for my research purpose. Um, step by step. You see here is actually my rootstock. Here is my scion. And I have a two, uh, well, in this research, I did a two scion variety, one uh, heirloom. One is uh, German pink. Uh, the other one is NNS, NNS Nor. And uh, I have a three or four, I, th I think this year I had uh, four different rootstocks. You can see those, uh, you know, to save me some time, I actually planted them at the same time. But usually, uh, you want to plant your rootstock uh, two to three days earlier than your scion. But I can do that um, uh, uh, just because I didn't want to plant them different days. So you can see those grow a little bit taller, but it's OK, because this is a scion. You can just get the top of it. So the most important is about uh, the size of your, uh, your rootstock. And then. This is a close shot of how the uh, th my rootstock look like. Oh no, this is actually the 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 scion, but your rootstock should be just like this as well. So you want a little bit longer uh, stem. This is not really a stem, if I use the strict term. So this part need to be a little bit taller and uh, strong. And uh, you cut it. You, you don't you don't want to do one by one. You you do a uh, tree by tree because it saves your time. Of course, when you first do it, you may want to cut maybe three or four, just give it, a, give it a shot to see how you do it, get a feeling of it. Of course, you have to be careful, don't cut yourself. You, when you cut it, you cut about a 45 degree angle, doesn't matter which way, just cut it. So you cut them all, 
and you you place a tube on it. So I mentioned that you know if you, if you look carefully, this one had a two piece of cotton linens, this one's not. People actually were debating about that. Uh, those two pieces of li uh, cotton linens actually help the plants to recover. However, in the future, one sucker or lateral buds will grow out from here and here. You have to remove them. So there are pros and cons. So I prefer to just cut them below it if it's long, if it's tall enough. Put uh, you know later you don't have to uh, prune your uh, remove the sucker of your 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 your, your plant. So you, you put them on it, this is what I did. And then you collect your scion. It's not wood, it's scion is seedlings. And uh, make sure you don't mess them up because you know, it's really easy to, to, to say because you cannot tell the difference. They are tomato seedlings. So make sure you label them really well because this, this is one mistake people can make. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it sounds like stupid, but people do make mistakes, like I do that too. So for, uh, I want to go back here. Um, you can see here, those are the rootstocks I cut. You know, I usually don't use them anymore. But if you want to save it, you can. Just, just stick them into uh, a soil medium, they will grow. And later, you can use cleft grafting method to do more. So by doing so, it will save you a lot of money. So you collect your uh, scion, and you know by doing those, you don't. It doesn't really matter anymore because you don't. You only need a part of this. You can cut it uh, at a higher uh, upper level or lower level. So, uh, but my my experiment this year is you cut it from here. Eventually, there, there will be two branches going out. You can still use them. If you don't want to waste them, you can still use them. Or if you cut them a little bit higher, you c it'll be even better because you'll grow a little bit faster if your seedlings are, are tall enough. So there are a lot of tricks you can play with to save money and also save your time because it's still faster than, than, grow, than growing from, with, uh, from seeds. So um, actually, if you... Uh, uh, if you want to use those scion, like uh, heirloom tomato here, um, this will come out exactly similar size to lateral branches. It's very interesting to, to, to see that. So um, here's my associate and my technician. I think Catherine's there. Uh, they are doing grafting for the first time this year, and they did a good job. So this is how you do it. So you put it on there, you cut your you know, you cut this way you, or cut that way, it doesn't really matter because you, as long as these two surfaces match each other, it will be great. So you can work with your scion to match the diameter of your rootstock. So if this is too big, you should go cut a little bit higher because tomato plants are very easy to grow. So this part is more critical, you know, it doesn't really matter if uh, if it's not m exactly matched to each other, um, they can grow up really well. For this case, you actually see this surface is, is covered, but uh, my uh, rootstock actually is a bit bigger than the, than the scion, so it still works. Okay, so when you grab them, you know, you, you st start with several cell packages. Those will start to show some wilt symptom. Don't worry about it. They will recover. Yeah, wait until you finish every single one of them, move them into a chamber. This is my chamber, and uh, you know, they look really sad. But uh, give it a couple of days, they'll come back. So don't worry about it. The most important thing is when you move them, don't uh, try to avoid those being touched because they are not connected there. The tube is not very strong. They can just, just, just go get off. So if you don't bother them, they'll be okay. So when you transfer them, be gentle. And then once the, you know, after seven, 10 days, you move them out and they are, they are as, as healthy as new. And uh, what you can do though, you don't see those tubes. You don't have to remove the tubes. As plants grow, they will fall themselves. And what you need to do is to collect them, sterilize them, and reuse them. 
Okay, so this is my plants. They grow really well. So, um, that's that's about the method we used for for a tomato um, in term in terms of tubing grafting. Um, when when you have made success successful gra uh, grafted tomatoes um, and plant them in the field, you do have to pay some uh, specific attention to that. Number one, when you plant them, you probably need to uh, plant your uh, your plant with the graft uni above uh, about one inches above the ground, at least above the ground. So don't bury them. Otherwise, the the the, the, the roots will be developed above the graft union and will lose the beauty of rootstock. And then you have to remove the suckers and the lateral buds that grow from your rootstock. You tell them, you tell the difference uh, when you will grow them. And then if you the high tunnel setting, you can keep one or two liters or even three liters. And if you keep two, actually you save uh, your seeds on your scion. You know, especially the hybrid seeds is very expensive. And the other management will be, this will be similar to normal tomatoes. However, because rootstock usually have a really strong root system, uh, we have been doing research on that. Uh, we think we cannot uh, see for sure yet because uh, it's not research based yet. Uh, the plants may need less water and less nutrients. So we'll be doing research on it. When do my time end? Ten. Do, do I finish 10.30 or, I mean 11.30? 45, okay, okay. Um, this is the picture I took from a neighborhood. You know, I'm a horticulturist. When I take a walk, I, said, I took to my wife, do you see the diff what's, the, what's wrong with this tree? She would say, no, nothing wrong. I think you see this is different because those are rootstock and those are your scion. So by design, you need to, to chop them off. Same thing for your, for your tomatoes. So, you know, this is, uh, is, is Tim Rainbow here? Okay, this is from your field. <laughs> I saw that you were not here. That's why I named you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, it's my field then. So we're we supposed to remove the suckers, otherwise grow into a jungle. This is one very easy mistake people will make. You, if you don't remove the sucker, because the, the plants, the vines from your rootstock grow so vigorously, they can take over. So you just harvest all those little tiny, not a tasty cherry tomatoes. <laughs> um, this was what this this there was this was me uh, pretending doing something uh, uh <laughs> in my high tunnel. Um, we we keep we we remove the suckers, not only rootstock but also the the scion to keep them going straight. So what do we do is keep this one one uh, one liter, and you see this all from my scion, not from my rootstock. The rootstock will be down here. And if you just imagine if if, if you have a the suckers, or, or you ca I call it lateral shoes, come out, it can grow really tall and produce in the cherry tomatoes root from rootstock. So yeah, pay attention to those. It's not working. That'd be too bad. <laughs> Ooh, sorry about that. Let me fix it. Okay, it's working. This is watermelon grafting. I have a uh, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, so I'll go through this quickly. And uh, um, if I didn't finish, I'll try to add something to my afternoon talk. Uh, but you are not obligated to my talk. Uh, go to my going to my talk. Watermelon grafting. This is the time schedule for cut grafting. Uh, basically, for insertion method, you can follow this time frame. Uh, I don't know if I have that in the handout. I guess not because that will be in the third part of the article. 
uh, basically you 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 for this cut grafting if you use bottle gourd as your rootstock or pumpkin your rootstock you have to do different strategies uh, you 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 sew your sign a little bit later than your rootstock and uh, after you know if after sewing your uh, seeding your uh, your scion, it takes about a week or so to do those gravity method. Um, we just give this one. So this is what the Chinese do: they pre-germinate their seeds. This is uh, this is the broader gourd seed, and uh, by doing pre-germinating, you make sure one cell has a one living plant. So that's what they do: they plant into the cells after pre-germinating, germinating, and uh, they grow into those rootstocks. You grow like this age. The earlier, the better, you know. But uh, they had the two pieces of cotton linen has to be kind of flat, and your first two leaves need to be small. At this stage, they can take very well when you do grafting. The other thing is when the two kerbs grow bigger, they hollow. They have a, you know, their stem will not be a solid piece anymore. Okay, so for your watermelon seeds, this is the insertion method. You can actually put plant a lot in one single tray. You know, this is how they germinate in, in, in sand. We can do that in different soil medium. I don't recommend people to do this much, but um, you can, if you do a lot of grafting, you can do this. This is how they do, because they're from nursery. What I do, I just go in different rows, you know, about maybe an inch apart for this. And this doesn't have to be in cells. It's just a really shallow flat. Put some soil media, put in your seed in there, they grow. Because all we need to use is the top part. And when they are small, um, it's better when, uh, for insertion method. So this is the insertion method. You, you get your rootstock, you remove the, the, the growth, growth tip, remove the, remove the leaves here, and then you cut, you cut your scion. You, you, you basically, you cut a one piece here, one piece there, Make it a V shape. You cannot see well. This is the razor blade, and then you can build your own uh, own tool to just make a hole. So I can use uh, um, some bamboo sticks. You know, uh, you can buy those. Even even the the the, the tea stick would do it. You know, just just try to use different ways to make a, a tool yourself. I use I used to buy the. Uh, What's the name, the English name? Chick kebab, some kind of, you know, the steak. You can cut it, yeah. You can cut it and make it whole. You, in, you insert a hole, it's a, it's a little bit of, it's a, about 45 degree angle towards one piece of your cotton linden. By doing so, it's a little bit stronger. And then you just insert, insert the, the watermelon or melon or, or cucumber piece in there. So just insert there, and you'll be down. So this is a nursery setting. They actually have a, a, you know, a lot of plants there. They have a different uh, uh, design for, for heating part. Uh, you know, that's how they do. And you can also do the same thing in your high tunnel or greenhouse. After graft them, you can just cover with one, uh, uh, one layer of plastic mulch. That would do it. Of course, before that, you want to spray with some water. Uh, then it had to be sterilized water, but it cannot be dirty water. And you know that's what they do. And uh, you know below that they work really well. You can also move to the chamber I just show you with tomato grafting, put it in there, and they will work work really well. And uh, for for insertion method is um, uh, for the first time to do it, you may have a you may have a less survival, but. Uh, in the f you know, once you work out the way you think is better for you, it's it's pretty easy. And uh, um, still, I think I could get up to 90%. Uh, there's some will die. This is how they look like. You know, this is very small, and uh, this stand really well. However, they grow into a watermelon transplant. This is two piece of the. Uh, I think this uh, this is border guard. Okay, uh, for cucumber uh, you and, and watermelon, you can use the ton approach. I'm going to show this very quickly because I'm running out of time. Uh, basically, you grew your rootstock into this size, and you cut it. You, you know, for, the, for your rootstock, you remove the, the, the growth tip, and then make a cut. You know, 
it's easier to cut this way. You, you grab your cut length and it's going down. And for your scion, you want to, you know, here is your top part of your plant. Here is the lower part of your uh, the top of the plant. So just different options, different directions. So you do that. You make a cut here and make a cut there. You cannot see really clearly. But uh, you, on this one, you can see. You put it into together and put a clip on it. And then you plant the finished product into a cell or, or, or a little pot and cut it down. And when you plant them, you have uh, two options. Number one, you can have uh, two root systems all planted at the same time. By doing so, your plants will, look in, will be looking so well because it does have roots on it. And later, you know, after seven, after eighty days, you may want to cut the root stock or cut the uh, scion roots. Uh, you know, it just goes through one more time. Or you can just uh, cut it here. You know, for example, this is your scion root, uh, root, the root system. Cut it and then plant them. By doing so. Your plant will be looking a little bit sad because the roots got cut. However, after seven to eight days, whenever they take, they take. You know, they will be successful. If you use the first method, you cut it, some of them probably will not make it. So either way will work. So this is how you do it, and uh, this is the timeline for you to do the town approach. And I, my recommendation is you better use the insertion method. It's hard for you to do. Uh, to do to do the town approach, however, town approach method always have a, s a higher survival rate. So keep that in mind. So eggplant grafting is uh, is actually cleft cleft grafting. Uh, this is the timeline. Uh, again, if you want my presentation, uh, I think it's gonna post on YouTube, or uh, you can email me. I'll, I'll email you a PDF version. And uh, my email address will be listed at the very end of my talk. So this is rootstock, and uh, this is your uh, grafted uh, seedlings. And you, for cleft grafting, just like a tomato cleft grafting method, the plants have to be a little bit uh, larger, about three to five pieces of uh, true leaves. And for, for eggplants, it grew about 30 to 35 days. They grow slow. And then, uh, it's pretty easy to do. You got that, you cut it here, and you cut your uh, scion. It just like uh, the cleft method on tomato, you put it in, put a clip on it, and it be you, 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 you'll be done. So uh, all I have uh, told you about was the uh, manual method. I don't think any of you here be interested in purchasing those kind of uh, gr grafting robots. Cost about 30 to to fifty thousand dollars a piece, so, but I just want to tell you that there, there is, there is other options, there are, and uh, uh, there is a uh, USDA ARS uh, scientist from Florida, he actually bought one piece, so, uh, didn't get, I, I didn't get to see it, however, uh, it worked for him, and so, uh, how many of you are actually farmers, not really serious? I mean, uh, the the home gardeners. A few. Oh, so okay. So I'm I'm including this one here. Um, I got a question asked. You know, do you think the farmer, uh, you know, the the mass gardeners, home gardeners, community gardeners can use the method? My answer is definitely sure. Why not? You're trying something new to begin with, right? And then you can you can be very creative doing something different, like this. You know, Starbucks produces this double delicious. Apples, you can do it in the same thing. And uh, uh, Donna uh, Effenberg from uh, Cape Girardeau, she actually organized a workshop. They grab, they grab, they, they didn't use real rootstock. They used uh, some cherry tomatoes. And they grafted some heirlooms or hybrid, they grew together. This piece grew, uh, grew heirloom, this piece grew cherry tomatoes. So it's always fun to have that. So, so what do they do? You know, they did some res they did some work. They are very creative, and uh, and this is how they they did it. So they just ask. Uh, I'll I'll read this really quickly. I still have about five minutes. So we had every participant bring a dark colored storage container, in which they placed wet paper towels and tapped uh, any air hose. Uh, those that brought clear storage containers. 
line the inside with a black, uh, black trash bag. So can be creative. And then after the plants were grafted, they were placed in these containers and take home, taken home. They were instructed not to open it for about a week, and then they could uh, uh, climb it them from there. So those are exactly the email text she sent to me, so I put it here. And then most participants who reported back had anywhere between 25 to 70 per five percent survival rate. And we were really surprised. You know, I wasn't really surprised when we didn't see the number 25. <laughs> but I can tell you, you know, over 70 percent survival rate is really easy to access uh, to, to be, you know, to, to get. I just wish we could would have uh, had a better growing seeding than, you know, they were talking about the 2011 seeding. So they use the different varieties, you know, cherry and maxi, maxi ford. Uh, I think I give them some seeds. So basically, if you want to try, even your farmer want to try this method, you can do it. Using this, you know, uh, using those kind of a tricks, you can you can start with your own grafted transplants. And uh, there are some local uh, nurseries already uh, s s uh, sold some grafted tomatoes this year. So they are not cheap, and uh, by coming to this session, I'm pretty sure you know you can do it. So um, here's my email. Uh, I do email pretty well um, because I travel all the time, if not all the time. Uh, so email me. It's my first name dot last name at uh, linkingu dot edu. It's also in your handout. Uh, so. Email me. I am usually return my email within 24 to 48 hours. Usually within 24 hours. Uh, let me see. Uh, I guess I can take one question. Yes, ma'am. Where, where are we as home gardeners or small producers supposed to get the clips and things that we used to do with this? Or can we come up with something on our own? Uh, her question is where to get those clips, you know, the material used for grafting or if she can come out uh, something on her own. Uh, I think the, you, you, if you Google the grafting tube, it can come out a lot of places you sell this. One, if, you, if you deal with uh, Johnny's, Johnny's, they sell that. And, uh, and for the creative part, if you want to do something yourself, you can use uh, uh, some grafting tape, especially the parafilm, the stretch ball parafilm, um, it's, uh, it's very uh, stretchable and uh, kind of transparent. You can use that, but just say it again. Okay, a coffee stirro, hollow. Okay, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. So, but remember, if you use a tape, you have to untape them when they tick. Uh, if you really wrap them really well, they cannot grow. Uh, you know, in you know later. So um, I'll be around today, and I'll be doing another talk for for uh, for small farm forum at one o'clock. You're welcome to my session, and uh, if you have other questions, catch me when I'm here. So uh, thank you for staying with me. <laughs>